San Mateo County is flowing with all kinds of natural wonders, among them the most amazing tide pools. On this episode of Pacific Currents, you're going to find out where are these tide pools and what can you find in them. I've lived along the uh, coast for many, many years. Uh, I'm an educator, so I've taken kids down to the tide pools. But what always is, strikes me is how um, varied the tide pools are and what you can find in them. And we're very lucky tonight to, ha to have Tom Ciotti, who is with the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. And uh, he's going to tell us some things about um, the tide pools, what you can find in them. Uh, and about the history of the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. So Tom, welcome. It's nice to have you on the show tonight. Thank you. So Tom, can you tell us how you got involved with the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve and how long you've been with them? Well, about 20 years ago, I bought a home right on the ocean in Montero, quite close to the reserve, visited it many times, always wanted to do something more in the reserve. So fortunately, my wife and I both decided to take the volunteer training course. We did and um, volunteered there for 10 years and I'm currently the president of the Friends of Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. So you really worked your way up. Uh, so to speak, yes. So Tom, for someone who's ever been down to the uh, Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, could you describe where it's located and what you'll see when you get there? Yes, it's about half, it's on, off of Highway 1, it's about halfway between Pacifica and Half Moon Bay. And you'll turn off Highway 1 onto California Avenue, and it's a short drive uh, west, and it dead ends right at the parking lot for the reserve. And adjacent to the parking lot is a visitor center. Um, there's restrooms there, and there's a main entrance down to the inner tidal right there. Just to the south of that, there's some trails that uh, that's part of the coastal trail, and there's a trail up along the bluffs. Once you go down to the main entrance, you can uh, access the beach area. It's a little bit rugged there. You have to cross the stream. It is difficult. The terrain is difficult. And of course, the beach is quite sandy, and many times it's rocky. Uh, and Tom, I remember when I've taken school kids there that um, the docents talked about the different zones, the tidal zones, could you describe those for us? The tidal zones are defined by how much is exposed at low tide. So the highest zone is called the splash zone, and that only gets splashed when the waves come up. The next zone is uh, down is the high tide zone, and that is even, it gets covered even, even less. And so then you go down to the mid zone, which is covered a little bit more, and then down to the low tide zone, where it's covered most of the time. And each of these zones has its own particular characteristics and its own particular wildlife. Absolutely. So the, um, the different, both the, the algae is different in each of the zones, as well as the animals that live there, different in each of the zones. So it's that specific. So some algae will live only in one zone, but not in another. Yes, uh, correct. Hmm. Amazing. So Tom, I understand that your wife is very much involved uh, as a docent also, and uh, she's going to give us a tour, an actual tour of the, of the tide pools. So um, tell us how, how she's going to take us down to the beach. Well, you'll start at the parking lot, and then you'll go down the main entrance, which is called a ramp. It ramps down, and then there's this little staircase, and there's, there's a stream that runs by right next to it, and she'll take you over the stream and then down into the tide pools. And we're going to actually see some of the creatures that live in the tide pools. Yes. Excellent. Hi, my name is Linda Ciotti. I'm the volunteer coordinator for the Friends of Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, and I've been a volunteer here for 10 years. These are California mussels. They live in 
beds here on the upper portion of the rocky area and they're attached to the rocks and to each other with bissel threads which is a fibrous material that they secrete and uh, that keeps them stable on the rocks. Here at the reserve the ochre sea stars are either orange or purple and they don't come in any other color. This is a leather sea star. This is a pink bay star and all of the kids know this as Patrick, one of the characters on Spongebob Squarepants. These are purple sea urchins and they also live in um, beds like the mussels. Uh, they settle in the larval state and so they settle where there are other species like themselves. This is a tide pool sculpin and they live in the tide pools and most of them have a home pool and they can camouflage themselves to match the surroundings in their own home pool. The holes in the rocks are formed by animals. Uh, we have perfectly round deep holes where the urchins live or have lived. Uh, the oval um, small indentations in the rocks are from chitons and limpets also were able to uh, carve out a spot in the rocks with their radula or their specialized tongue. So this orange ochre sea star is eating a sea urchin and they're able to do that because they can extend their stomach around the urchin to enter the urchin's mouth which is on uh, the underside of the urchin. This is a sola anemone, which is related to the giant green anemone, and it, the distinguishing feature is the stripes or lines that radiate from its mouth toward its tentacles, and that's what distinguishes it from a giant green anemone. And also, this is almost now the predominant larger anemone species in the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, whereas before it was the uh, giant green anemone. And we think they have come up to the colder waters because they used to be a more southern species. The snail is a leafy hornmouth snail and the distinguishing feature with that uh, snail is it has a ridge on its upper shell so if it gets knocked off the rocks it'll tumble down into a pool but it always lands on its foot. The little tiny sea star is a baby ochre sea star. Uh, the low tide zone is the area where when the tide is at its lowest point it gets exposed and this this area we can explore when there's a minus tide like today. This is a mossy chitin and a chitin is a mollusk that's upper shell is divided into eight plates so it's uh, very distinctive in that regard and it's also advantageous so as the chitin uh, is grazing on, on top of the rocks its shell is able to bend and flex with the curvature of the rocks. This is a nudibranch, which is a mollusk that has evolved out of its shell. This is a sea lemon, and you can see it has gills on its left end, and on the head side there are two little antennae that are called rhinophores, which are sensory organs. And most nudibranchs uh, only eat sponge. So that little walk with Linda was really wonderful. I love that part, especially when you, you saw the sea star that was actually um, eating a sea urchin because I love to tell the kids how the, the stomach actually comes out of its mouth and digests the, the body of the sea urchin and then it goes back inside. The kids think that's really gross, but you know, all part of sea life. But anyway, there are some uh, animals we did not get to see in the video. Could you tell us about some of the other uh, animals that you can see down there? Well, one of the neat things about the reserve is that it's every, every time you go down there, it's a, it's a unique experience. So there are yeah. over 400 species that live down there, so you n never know what you're going to see at any given time. So up in the high tide zone, you can sometimes see green line shore crabs. They hide in the crevices. That's why the crabs are really thin. They hide. You can see different algae up there. The rockweed is really interesting. Things that look like bugs that, that live uh, in the rockweed up in that area. Lots of snails, lots of different kinds of snails. The hermit crabs occupy the, the abandoned shells of the snails, and there are uh, several kinds of hermit crabs down there. You know, the kids love to see them because they do scamper around and they stuff. They do, yeah. You know, they always hide when you come up because they actually feel the vibrations as you're walking, and that's, that's how they sense that you're there. Um, the, as you get down into the tide pools a little bit, you see lots of anemones. When they're exposed, they cover themselves with rocks and shells to hold the water in and to protect themselves from the sun. 
some of the biggest ones, the big giant green ones that you see in the deep tide pools, they can be quite old, 25 to 100 really? years old. Really? Yeah. They've done genetic studies on them and they haven't been able to find the senescence genes, which are the genes that make you and I old, but they haven't been able to find them in, in any of the anemones yet. So they hmm. expect them to live a long time. Beautiful sea stars. We have uh, many different varieties of sea stars. The largest one has up to 24 arms. It's beautiful. That's it's incredible. Comes in either a gunmetal gray version or a really brilliant orange version. Now, is it, are they common? Can you see them fairly often? Yes, a lot of times you can see them. The lower the tide, the better, because they like it farther down, deeper down, and they often come up into the tide pools to feed, but they're usually in the deeper channels. And if you're lucky, sometimes you can actually see an octopus? Yes, I was out there yesterday and, and, uh, with a lady from Colorado and, we, and her daughter, and we saw an octopus, yes. It's exciting, because you don't see too many octopuses in, in Colorado. No, no, uh, there are no uh, they don't have rocky shores there, they just have rocky mountains. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some of the bigger animals uh, are seals, and what kind of seals do you find out there? Harbor seals, you find uh, harbor seals out there. This is just right at the start of pupping season. We have about 250 seals that live there year round. They typically are out of the water uh, when sometimes they'll be right up on the beach, which will prevent you from going down the beach because you can't disturb them. Other times they'll be, they'll be what we call hauled out, that's getting out of the water. And there's two spots that they really like to do that, right at the main entrance. But if you go down past, there's an area called Cypress Point. If you just go down past the first point south, the whole tide pool area opens up down there and there are no more harbor seals. Hmm. So that's really the best place to get out because you can go all the way out without disturbing any harbor seals. And then if you're a bird lover, lots of different species of birds are around there? Lots of birds. The one that's probably the funniest out there is the black oyster catcher. There's, those are the ones with the orange beaks, mm -hmm. sort of pry limpets off of the rocks with their, their beaks. White egrets down there, the big herons, the yes. big great herons. They're great fishermen. They, they walk around very quietly in the, in the tide pools and then stab things with their beaks. You've got the California gull yes. and the western and gull. the western gull, yeah. There are pelicans down there that they fly in, in, in rather large groups, usually in the shape of a bee. Which is wonderful to see because they came close to extinction for a while and they, they came back and now it's wonderful to see them. Yes, and of course they almost went extinct because of the use of DDT. Yes. So. And I know any time you're out at the tide pools, you have to be really careful about some things. So could you tell us what things you do have to be careful about? At Fitzgerald, there are three things that you really have to be careful about. The first is that it's very slippery. Uh, the rock is slippery. A lot of the algae is extremely slippery. So you want to take your time. You want to walk carefully uh, so, that you, so that you maintain your balance. You don't want to jump over things, and you certainly don't want to run out there. The other thing, of course, are the waves and the water. Really good not to turn your back on the waves, especially if we have large waves out there, and to watch the waves all the time. Always a good policy. Yes. Yeah. The other thing are the cliffs. Um, the cliffs erode at an uh, average of about 18, 18 inches a year, so we get rock slides. And so if you're out there with children, you want to keep them from climbing on the cliffs because it is dangerous. And then what are some of the rules that the uh, reserve has for people about um, the, the wildlife there? There are basically four rules. The first is that you want to walk very carefully. You want to minimize the amount of marine life that you might step on. It's very difficult because there's a lot of life. I mean, it's covered. I mean, it's just covered with life out there. But it, the, you want to be fairly careful. You don't want to try to step on the anemones because, of course, they're soft-bodied and you can injure them. The other thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to collect anything. It's unlawful to collect things, so you don't want to take any rocks, any shells, certainly any animals from the, from the tide pools. The third thing is that you, it's unlawful to pick any animals up out there. So you can't pick up animals out there. You want to just leave them and view them where they are. And the fourth thing is that you don't want to turn over any rocks. The reason for that is that there are a lot of small juvenile animals living underneath them that can really be damaged by just turning them over and misplacing the rock. They're easy to crush, so we don't allow people to turn any rocks over out of the reserve. So it's basically look, don't touch. Look, don't touch. You can take a camera with you. Yeah, take of course. Take pictures of it. 
And, and the colors of the algaes are so amazing. Well, in fact, the colors of all the, the creatures out there are so amazing that this is like a photographer's dream mm. to go down there, especially if you have a, a, a good lens and you can get out close-up shots. Tom, can you tell our viewers how the uh, Fitzgerald Marine Reserve got started in the first place? It was a collaboration between the state of California and the county of San Mateo. In the mid-1960s, um, the state got together with the county and talked about having a, res having a reserve out there. So the county actually purchased the land where the parking lot is originally. They, they purchased land and that's actually a, a county park. At the same time, uh, what the state was doing is that they were trying to pass legislation, which they finally did in 1969, to set aside the intertidal and a thousand yards out as the marine reserve. So after the mid-1960s, when they actually set up the reserve, the county of San Mateo has acquired more land along, along the coastline. First the bluff area, and then the Pillar Point Bluff area, and the marshland down by Princeton. In 2010, the state expanded the boundaries of the reserve northward to the Montero State Beach and outward three nautical miles. So what used to be the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve is now totally encompassed within a new state marine reserve called the Montero State Marine Reserve. Well, that's excellent. Yes, and that's a totally no-take. It's the most highly conserved and protected area that there is. And there's some trails that are included in that uh, recent Yes, there are trails, and very, very recently, the trail that is uh, right at the eastern edge of, of the bluff area called the Dardanelle Trail, they expanded that and made it part of the, the coastal trail that extends all the way along the coast. I've walked some of that trail, and it's just beautiful, absolutely astounding. It is. They're gorgeous uh, cypress trees that were yes. planted there in the uh, early 1900s. It's a beautiful area. Well, I love the fact, too, that as you're walking on these trails, you can see a lot of geology right, right at your feet. Yes, the best place to see that is on the bluff trail. And when you get up to the top, you can look out and you can see some of the geology. There's a fault line that runs right out at the main entrance. It runs right under a house there. And just to the north of that is a really interesting geologic formation called a plunging syncline. We get a lot of geology classes that come out to the reserve. To the south of that, where the fault line goes out in the ocean, that's where you see all the uplifted rock because it's mm -hmm. a type of fault where one side moves up and keeps going north, and that's the, on the south side. So all of that land that's exposed is caused by the geology out there. The rock that you see is a sedimentary rock. It's primarily a mix of California mudstone and shale, and it's a part of a formation called the Purissima Formation. And it's really quite soft, and that's why you see all those crevices and that great habitat for all the animals down yeah. there. Well, we've been talking a lot about the uh, Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, but there are lots of other tide pools along the coast. So could you tell us of some others that are worth visiting? Probably the best one is right next door, just around Pillar Point. It's called the Pillar Point Reef, and you can access that where you go to watch the Mavericks contest. There's also excellent tide pooling at Bean Hollow Beach uh, south, and then just south of Pigeon Point where the lighthouse is, there's some excellent tide pooling there too. So one could actually, uh, for a nice outing, go visit the tide pool and then go see the elephant seals, which is just further down at Año Nuevo. So going north, there's some good tide pools at the north end of Lindemar Beach, and then some, also some good tide pools at Muscle Rock, right where the San Andreas Fault runs out into the ocean. Oh, right, yes. Now, I know, Tom, that tide pools are no different than other parts of the environment that are being challenged by a lot of different issues. So perhaps you could tell us some of the issues that are now affecting tide pools and what we need to know about this. Well, certainly climate change uh, is, is a major one. Um, we're putting lots of carbon dioxide into the air. Um, that carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the water and it increases the pH, the acidity of the, uh, rather it decreases the pH and, and acidifies the ocean. When that happens, it's harder for animals to make shells um, at, a, at a lower pH. It's devastating the coral reefs, for yes, example. Yes, the coral reefs are getting hit badly, but 
but ultimately it'll affect all these animals, like crabs, um, all of the snails. They're, it's going to be much harder for them to make shells. It's going to use up a lot more energy to do that. The other thing is, is that a lot of, uh, although it, that water looks really clean, there are a million bacteria in two drops. And so a lot of the bacteria live in a fairly small temperature range. And so as soon as you start warming up the water, you may get different bacteria, which very well may affect the animals out there. Now, is this bacteria uh, a natural bacteria? or yes. is it, Or is it uh, compounded by human pollution? No, it's natural bacteria. And that's why at some point you can't eat uh, shellfish because that bacteria gets into the... Uh, Actually, the, the, there's a... a dinoflagellate that's out there, it's a small, small critter, um, and when it dies, it actually uh, creates some neurotoxins, and the neurotoxins oh. are actually siphoned out of the water by the mussels, and, and the neurotoxins uh, go into their tissues. Okay, so we've talked about the, the pollution, um, we've talked about climate change, any other issues? Well, I imagine one issue, too, is people going in and disturbing these areas when they're not supposed to. Yes, for sure. And you can, uh, if you looked at pictures of Fitzgerald in the, at, the turn of the, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, you would have seen thousands of abalone out there. And, of course, they were all harvested out by, by humans. Um, it's hard to assess the, imp the human impact because there's so much going on out there. You know, you've got 30-foot waves coming in. You've got rocks moving all over, you've got sand scouring things. So it's, it's really hard to assign a particular effect caused by human impact. The other thing that, may, uh, that climate change may affect are wind directions and currents. And we rely on up upwelling off of our coast, that is cold water being brought up along with all the nutrients. If that gets altered by climate change, we're gonna find the diversity of life dramatically affected. By that. Exactly, and tide pools are indicators of the ocean health in general, so uh, if the tide pools start to deteriorate, then that means the whole ocean is being affected. Yes. There are some species out there that are particularly uh, sort of canaries uh, in, in the mine shaft, mm -hmm. and one of those is the nudibranchs. Those are the butterflies of the tide pool, those beautiful colored creatures, and they have a, they have a very diverse um, diet that they eat a lot of different things and so when they start going down people start worrying because it's an indication that their food sources are no longer available. So you have scientists and, and science students coming in and uh, doing research on the tide pools all the time? Yes, uh, we collaborate, the Friends of Fitzgerald collaborate with the California Academy of Sciences and we actually do nudibranch surveys. We survey the number and of species and and the number of nudibranchs totally that we find out there on a quarterly basis. That's amazing. Hmm. So if somebody wants to go visit the tide pools, what do they need to do in order to uh, prepare for it? Well, they need to find out when the low tide is. And the best way to do that is to visit our website where we have the low tides all listed. The other thing you can do, it, it's listed in the paper, uh, both of the papers, uh, the, the San Francisco Chronicle, the, the San Jose Mercury, both have tide tables in the weather section. You have to remember that the tides there are given at the Golden Gate, and we're about an hour earlier. Uh, so you have to, you have important. to come to an hour earlier. There are also a lot of apps uh, that you can get for, uh, for a com on your computer that, that show what the tides are. We sell tide tables at, at, uh, at the visitor center, uh, the Friends of Fitzgerald do. And so you want to go when the tide is between a, about a plus one and anything lower than that. And you want to get there probably about an hour before the low tide and plan to spend about an hour after low tide, about a two hour window. What kind of clothes and shoes should you wear? You should layer because it's, it, uh, you can be down there and if the sun drops a little bit it can get pretty cold. Uh, the weather can change rapidly down there. Um, you want to wear footwear that can get wet. Um, I wear hip boots when I go out there, and a lot of other people do too. Um, if, you're gonna, if you're not going to wear, if you're just going to wear regular shoes, you should bring a change of socks, definitely. 
So if you're a leader of a, a scout group or a church group or a school group, um, what, are the, what kind of arrangements do you have to make as a group coming to the, to the reserve? If you're a group of 10 or more, you have to make a reservation with the San Mateo County Department of Parks. And you should uh, go on their website and there's a telephone number that you can call to get reservations. The reservations uh, cost $35. And the groups are limited to 100. You can't have more than 100 in a group. And they're pretty strict about making reservations. You can't just show up. If you show up, it's likely you're going to be turned away. So you have to make reservations. As a group. As a group. All right. Now, Tom, I presume that you have room for maybe a few more volunteers in your group. So can you tell us how you get involved uh, if you want to be a volunteer? If you would like to volunteer at the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, you should get in touch with the Friends of Fitzgerald Marine Reserve at our website. We have a training class uh, once a year, usually uh, starting in January, and it, run, we have, it runs maybe nine to 12 weeks. It's a heavy dose of marine biology, as you would expect, and, and a lot of um, activities involving uh, interpretation mm -hmm. in, in the tide pools. And um, we do a lot of mentoring, it's classroom work as well as field work. So you can, if you want to join us, that's what you need to do. Now, of course, you don't get paid as volunteers, but what's the payoff for you for being a volunteer? Well, it's at many levels. Um, it's great being out there. It's just, it's wonderful to be there. It's wonderful. We always say we have an ocean of information to share. And so we love to go out there and explain to people you know, what it is they're seeing and what's going on out there. The kids are fabulous. The kids are fun to be with. They're, they always have a lot of wonderful, wonderful questions. They're just really fun to be with. So if you wish to volunteer with the Friends of Fitzgerald, please visit our website. We'd love to have you. Even if you can't volunteer, just please come out and visit with us. Well, Tom, I want to thank you very much for coming on our show tonight. It's been Great talking with you about the tide pools. And folks, I hope this motivates you to go visit the fabulous tide pools that are in San Mateo County, right along our very own coast. So if you want to join, uh, you know, the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve volunteers, you know how to do that. And I hope that you'll go and see the tide pools very soon because there's lots out there to see. So until next time, you can always catch our shows on YouTube. Come and see us again next time. Thanks a lot.